Brain rule number six is excited. Your brain hates boring stuff. It wants to get excited. We're getting into the area of positive psychology, how to lift human performance using psychology into another dimension. I want to talk about the deferred life plan, the myth in most Western countries that we should wait until we retire and then we can be happy. It's a myth and needs to be exploded on several fronts. First, happiness is now, not when. Success is a journey, not a destination. We'll come back to that in just one moment. Second, why would we wait until we're past the prime of our life to enjoy our life? Third, as it turns out, sitting on a beach and rubbing coconut butter all over your stomach is great fun for about three weeks. After that, the brain rule comes in where we need to get excited. Our brain hates boring stuff and sitting on a beach is fun for a while, then it's boring. The deferred life plan is a myth. Get happy now, not when. For me, I spent a lot of time in my life thinking about getting happy later. And I'll tell you a little story about my time as a professional triathlete. For me, making a national elite triathlon team was my big wish in life. I thought that would make me very, very happy. And I trained for several years without quite getting that success. And I thought, gee, my life will be so much better when I make this team. This will happen, that will happen, all sorts of things will happen. One year, training went really well, racing went really well, and this is in the days before emails and texts, but I eventually got the letter in the mail, congratulations, you've made the team. Now, when you make a triathlon team, one of the bonuses, at least for me, is lots of lycra will arrive in the mail. And it did, it was black and silver and white, and let's not get into all the details, but I did try it on in front of the mirror and my family, everyone all denied, and we're all very happy, and then what I realised is I was exactly the same person with exactly the same problems as I was before I'd made that team. A very, very important learning for me, happiness is now, not when. There's nowhere we're going, folks, that's going to make us happy. Happiness is working towards getting there. And to carry that story a little further, I think once I realised that and started realising that the training was the fun, the racing was the fun, making these teams was just incidental, I was able to go on and be a much higher level performer for the next several years and make those teams without even caring if I did or not. Happiness is now, not when. Success is a journey, not a destination. And this myth of the deferred life plan, somehow putting off happiness for some other time is the scourge of the Western world. The brain rule is, get excited. Your brain hates boring stuff. It wants to get it on and get excited. Let's do a thought experiment to think about our life. In this thought experiment, you win the lottery. You've gone down and bought a lotto ticket and you've won first division by yourself. The question is, how will your life change? Oh, I'm gonna stop doing this, 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 and this, and I'm going to start this, 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 and this. And when you weigh those two things up, and you say, ah, oh, that's my whole life. The question is, what are you waiting for? Excitement and life is now. Let's up the stakes. Forget the lottery, you've developed a terminal illness. You've got two years. The question again, what are you going to stop within the bounds of reality? This, this, this and this. And what are you going to start? And why are you starting it? You're probably going to start it because it's exciting and it means something to you. The question is, why aren't you starting it now? What are you waiting for? Life is now not when. If you're journeying towards something, then you need to get some clarity and control. Clarity, where are you going? Let's think about what Michelangelo said. The problem for most people isn't aiming too high and missing, it's aiming too low and actually hitting. 
So let's first of all aim high, get excited, that's the brain rule, and go for it. The second thing is to think about control. And I see this in sport and sports psychology a lot. Let's think about controlling the things that we can control and forget the rest. I like to think about golfers. The golfer on the 17th tee, his putting's been going badly all day. What can you do on a 17th tee shot about your putting? And the answer is, of course, nothing. All you can do is stay in that moment and enjoy the fact that you're taking a 17th tee shot. Clarify, aim high, control, worry about the things that you have control over. One of the most powerful ways to engage your brain and get it excited is to concentrate on what you're doing. What do I mean? I'm talking about the notion of mindfulness. This is something that started to pervade psychology in the whole of medicine in recent years. The idea that happiness is right now being in that moment of right now is all you can really do as, as being a human. When you're alive, stay in the moment. Sure, we need to worry about paying the bills. Sure, we need to worry about some things that have happened before, but life is now. And when we do what we call mindfulness meditation, it's one of the most powerful ways to make us happy, reduce depression, and improve our contentment with life in general. Mindfulness meditation is about taking the deep breathing techniques for reducing stress we've learnt before and concentrating on enjoying the sensations of being alive now. It's deep, slow breathing whilst concentrating on the now. Mindfulness can be particularly useful for things like enjoying eating, taking some time to chew and enjoy your food. I'm not sure about you, but I like food. And mindfulness eating is one of the most powerful ways of managing how much food you eat and enjoying it. Just a little tip here, and if you've, if you've got a job which involves sitting at a keyboard, go back to your keyboard, turn it upside down and bang it. If stuff falls out that may have once been food, you've failed the mindfulness for eating test. What I mean there is that's a good indication that you are eating and using your computer at the same time. And that's a crime against food and a crime against work. Both of those things can be fun. Let's just do them one at a time. Now, I want to talk about optimism. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? Now, we'll know people that are slight pessimists, the glass is half empty, and those are the people we tend not to like to associate with. There's the people where the glass is half full, the realistic optimis optimists, and people like them, they attract other people, they're generally happier, and things just seem to go well for them. Are you born like this or can you change it? Well, for me, in psychology, I find this the hardest thing. I think I had an upbringing where often we would interpret things in my family as slightly pessimistic. But the good news for me is that you can train your brain to view things optimistically. The glass can be half full. And it's just a matter of reappraising and taking a few deep breaths and thinking about the situation. An example of this for me was a few days ago, I actually put the bath on to do some relaxation. Then I forgot that I put the bath on. It started flowing everywhere. In fact, the water was so deep that it was flowing through one floor and coming out the roof of the next floor down. So we mopped it up and cleaned it up and got all the towels out and mopped up all the water. And I even surprised myself here by saying, that was fantastic. We needed to wash some of those towels anyway. Yes, the house had been flooded, but it's going to dry out. In fact, it's already dried out. And the towel's got to wash. It's all good. You can learn to reappraise and take that slightly optimistic view. We need to contain it within reality. We start to think about those people who are optimistic, but it now starts to exceed the bounds of reality. Some people call those people nutters. Let's not move into that category. Let's just stay optimistic with reality. Remember, it's up to you how you see the world, but what else does psychology tell us about the pursuit of happiness? The brain 
is a social organ. It loves meaningful human interactions. We know that if you're over 70 and you're not a member of a social group, if you join one social group, you improve your life expectancy by five years. That's how much the brain loves socializing, but particularly meaningful relationships, not having 350 friends on Facebook that you don't interact with. It's about communicating face to face in meaningful ways. Another thing that the brain loves is gratitude. And we live in a society where we are bombarded with one million advertising messages every month. These messages are saying, look at what you don't have. Lots of other cultures who have a lot less money have much higher happiness, primarily because they focus on what they do have. And something that researchers have shown is very beneficial for the brain is a gratitude ritual. I have a gratitude ritual every morning in the shower. When I turn it on, I'm grateful that I have warm water because I remember from the military what cold showers feel like. I'm also grateful that I have running water because I've been in villages in third world countries where they don't have it. When I wash myself, I'm grateful that I have my hands. I've seen people without hands or with leprosy on their fingers. And then I start to think about the fact that I have a house, that I have a family, that I have friends, that I don't live in a war zone, that I have lots of things that about 90% of the world don't have. When we focus on gratitude, it lights up the happiness centers in the brain. The point of a gratitude ritual is to focus on what you do have rather than what you don't. Because research has shown if you do that, you'll have less depression and much more contentment, life satisfaction, happiness and mental vitality. It's always good to give thanks for what we have, but also to stay in the moment. Let me tell you a story. The brain wants to be excited and it loves to get that excitement now. One of the big learnings for me was from my four-year-old. And I want to tell you a story about a four-year-old's birthday cake. It was a Noddy cake from Noddy and Big Ears. And I know there's issues about Noddy and Big Ears, but we were still with Noddy. Now, we brought out the Noddy cake to our family of four. Four candles burning brightly. And we brought it out to Jackson, the new four-year-old, and we set it down on the table and we sang Happy Birthday. We finished that and my wife Louise said, Jackson, you need to make a wish. And he took a deep breath and whoosh, he sprayed and spat all over the cake and all the candles were out. Fantastic. Dad, me, then broke all the rules of wish making. I said, Jackson, what did you wish for? And this was a great moment. He looked up incredulously and said, a piece of cake. Of course he said that. What was I thinking? Perhaps he might be worried about his school in two years' time, perhaps his university, some postgraduate study. No, he's in his fourth birthday, with his fourth birthday naughty cake, what else would you wish for in that moment? And I think our children have that knowledge of being in the moment and enjoying and getting excited about now, not when. And somehow we start to lose that as we get older. We worry about next week, about yesterday, the things that we can't control. Happiness is now, not when. <laughs>